Welcome to Calvary. Glad you guys are here today. Hopefully you're having a good day. If you have a Bible, I want you to turn to two places, Revelation chapter 1 and uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Revelation 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We'll begin in Revelation chapter 1 today. How's everybody doing today? Good. So you didn't go to the camp out. You, we stayed home. We did. And, uh, you know, Cheryl went up and she took eight of our bigger kids and left me home with the three six-year-olds. And so, and I'm happy to report that they are all still alive and here at church and all dressed, I might add. And this year we even came to church wearing shoes, which was an improvement from last year. Now, one of my six-year-olds is wearing his 12-year-old sister's shoes, but he does have shoes. So... So I'm improving, so that's kind of good. Well, we're going to jump right into our Bible study today. We have been taking a few weeks to talk about the subject of Bible prophecy. Now, one-third of the Bible deals with prophecy, and so we wanted to take a few weeks just to get a handle, take some broad strokes, and, and just to, to talk about that. We're talking about what we would call last days or end times prophecy to see what, what the Bible might, might have to say. And the reason that we're doing this, if I could put a, a verse on the screen, 2,000 years ago when Jesus was on the earth, one of his most, most scathing rebukes to, uh, sadly, the religious leadership is that uh, he, he said, well, I'll just read it. From Matthew 16, he says, do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times? You see, the Bible had laid it out completely, all the ways that, all the things that had to happen for him to appear the first time. And sadly, they never looked at it. And so not looking at it, he did not appear based upon their preconceived ideas. And so when he arrived, most people missed it because they never looked at what the Bible had to say. And so the Bible speaks twice as much about his second or his next appearing than it does his first appearing. So if he held them responsible to know, we feel that we should at least take a few weeks to talk about, talk about the subject. So a few weeks ago, as we began, we talked about that big sign, and the big sign that would begin what you and I would call the last days or that last generation was that Israel would become a nation again. It's the only nation on the planet in the history of the world that existed as a nation, ceased to exist as a nation, and almost 2,000 years later, as the Bible said, became a nation again. And that was in 1948. So we looked at a map, and one of the things that we highlighted is that Israel is right there in the middle of the Middle East, and they are surrounded by a host of enemies. And uh, we, we talked about how very small Israel is in comparison to everybody else. If we go to the next, next picture, we put Israel there in a map of Florida, and what we find is that Israel is about the size of Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach counties. And uh, it's, it's although it's very small and they can't, although they're surrounded by a number of enemies, nobody seems to be able to do anything about them. And that's because God said, I'm going to bring them back into their homeland. And, and uh, that would begin that time period. So the whole world is focused in on what do we do with Israel? And people take stands on that. But God says, this is what I'm doing. So we looked at that. And then we looked at the theme of the end times and that the word that keeps coming up is deceit and deception. And we took a week to talk about two glaring deceptions that have really crept into the church after Israel became a nation. We, we, we looked at that. And then we looked in Matthew 24 as Jesus gave the overview of the things that would be taking place in that final generation that would be increasing. And he used the term birth pangs closer and closer together and more and more intense. And uh, the reason that that was so important is that when we see those, these things taking place around us, it, it wouldn't be so that we would say that things are falling apart, but we'd say things are falling into place just like the Bible said. And then last week we looked at what the Bible said concerning the last church. It's the only church that Jesus had to remind that he's actually the creator because apparently in the church in those last days they have embraced some other method that it all came into existence. We took a whole uh, teaching last week to talk about that, so we're not going to do that today. Today we're going to look at how that generation wraps up. We're going to look at an event. It's called the rapture of the church, and we're going to talk about this. And let me just say on the, on the front end of this, and I might say it again, uh, this is so incredible that there's absolutely no way you and I would ever believe this 
if the Bible didn't speak about it so much. And so we're going to look at that today. So as we get into this, we have to begin in Revelation chapter 1. Now, uh, as we said last week, we, we went through this six years ago, so I'm assuming that it's still very fresh in your mind. And so uh, you just hop in at any point, but we kind of have to do this. So as we begin Revelation chapter 1, uh, there is a rumor going around this town. And there are those who are saying that the book of Revelation is hard to understand. But au oh, contraire say we, for you see the word revelation itself means that something has been revealed. Absolutely. If God wanted to conceal something, he would have called it the concealation, not the revelation. And what is it that's revealed here in the book of Revelation? Well, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 begins by saying, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Literally, Jesus is going to be revealed in this book, which God gave him to show his bond servants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bond servant, John. Well, God so wanted his people to read this book that he promised for those that would read this book, they would receive a very special blessing. And that blessing is found in Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. It's the only book of the Bible that says, read me, I'm special. Revelation 1, verse 3, it says, blessed is he who reads. You want to make sure that that's underlined in your Bible. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it for the time is near. It'd be very hard for me to believe in a God who says, I'll bless you if you read it. I want you to hear it. And I want you to heed the things that are written in it. But here's the thing, you're never going to understand it. It'd be very hard for me to believe in a God like that. Well, God knew that there would be people saying that the book of Revelation is hard to understand. So to make this book understandable, God placed in this book its very own outline, which is found in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. Let's look at it. Revelation 1, verse 19, only book of the Bible that has its own outline. John is told, therefore, write the things which you have seen. And that'll be the first part, the things which are, you want to underline that, and the things which shall take place after these things, after these things. There's three divisions in the book of Revelation. The first one, John is told to write the things that he has seen. So what is it that John has seen so far in this book of Revelation? Well, he's seen Jesus in his, what we might say, his glorified state. Notice verse 13. This is what John has seen so far. In the middle of the lamp stands, I saw one like a son of man clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. And it goes on to talk and describe him. That's what John has seen. But then it says, write the things, the second uh, division in the book of Revelation will be the things which are. Now, the things which are will refer to what you and I would call the church age. Revelation chapters 2, 2, and 3, Jesus dictates seven letters to seven churches. In their order, they lay out 2,000 years of church history with absolute precision. If you reverse the order of any of the churches, it makes absolutely no sense. But in their order, they lay out 2,000 years of church history. But then uh, you come to the, and we looked at the last church uh, last week. And again, that was the only church that Jesus had to remind that he's the creator. And we looked at that last week. So he says, write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which shall take place after these things. And I'm going to suggest after the, what you and I would call the church age. So the next time we find that phrase, after these things, will be in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Let's look at it. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. And it says, after these things, after what things? Well, after chapters 2 and 3, Jesus dictates seven letters to seven churches. After that, he says, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. You want to underline some of this. And the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, come up here and I will show you what must take place. You can take it to the bank. Must take place after these things. This is the third division in the book of Revelation, and Jesus wants to make sure that we get it, that he includes after these things at the beginning of the verse, and then at the end of the verse, just to make sure that we don't miss it. So interesting that when it says after these things, John hears the door open in heaven, sees the door open in heaven, a voice says, come up here. And that refers to the event that you and I would call the rapture of the church. 
Now what's interesting, as John goes up, the word church is mentioned over 20 times in the first three chapters. But from chapter 4, verse 1, to the end of the book, what word is glaringly absent? It's the word church. And the reason the word church no longer appears is because the church is not part of the story. Uh, Now, in the final paragraph of the book, after the story and the closing remarks, the word church is mentioned. It's just not part of the story on the ground. The church is in heaven. So the church goes up, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, and then what comes down? Wrath. And that's found in Revelation chapter 6, verse 16. Everybody flip over to chapter 6, verse 16. This is the opening volley of that time period that's commonly referred to as the tribulation. We'll talk about that a little bit. And it says, they said to the mountains and to the rocks, chapter 6, verse 16, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne. That will be a reference to God the Father. And then it says, and from the wrath of the Lamb. You want to underline that. Now the Lamb in the Bible is always a picture of Jesus. It's always Jesus. Here, the wrath of the Lamb. Then then verse 17, for the great day of their wrath, that's the one on the throne, God the Father and the wrath of the Lamb, their wrath has come and who is able to stand? Um, So you you have, people are surprised that right now you and I have this amazing opportunity to invite Jesus in. He offers us salvation. He offers us relationship. He offers us uh, the Holy Spirit. He offers us purpose and meaning in life. There are many who would look at him and say, I reject that, even though he offers that, not realizing that if we don't receive him this way, then we encounter him the other way. And that's a conversation for another day. Now, interesting, uh, just a, a little tidbit. You remember when Jesus was on the earth and he would go from synagogue to synagogue there on, on Saturday, and, and uh, he would teach in the synagogues, and he would read. Well, there's a very interesting little story in Luke's gospel. I put it there on your outline. And it says, as was his custom, he, that's Jesus, entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. One of the things you get from that is that Jesus always made worship a priority. So he stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah, and underline Isaiah, was handed to him. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written. And he's quoting from the Old Testament. Anytime you see the font change, it tells you that they're quoting from the Old Testament. Here's going to be from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, and he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he stops right there, and then it says he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And then it says, and all the eyes in all the synagogue were fixed on him. And it says, and he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, if you're like me, and I grew up in the church, I'd read that a bunch of times, but I missed the significance of what's going on. There, Jesus reads... He hands it back and he says, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. And uh, so, and everybody's looking at him. Well, part of the reason that they're looking at him is when he says, this has been been fulfilled today in your hearing, part of the reason is that's what we would call a messianic passage, that, that, that would be of the coming Messiah, the coming Christ. And so Jesus says, this has been fulfilled today in your hearing. Basically what he's told them is that I am the Christ, I'm the Messiah, and this is fulfilled. So that's part of it. But the other part of it that we miss is that he stops reading at a certain point and he hands it back and he says, this has been fulfilled. Well, these people know their Bible. They know their Old Testament and they know that Jesus has left something out and they're wondering, why didn't you read that, that next part? So I put that part there on your outline. So here's what it says all the way back in Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, and that's where he stops, so so let's underline this as we go, and the day of vengeance of our God. Does everybody see that? Jesus doesn't read that last part because that part is not fulfilled on that day. When does that part begin to be fulfilled? 
Well, that takes place in Revelation chapter 6 when it says, hide us from him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. It's coming. It's not that it's not going to happen. It just hasn't been fulfilled yet. Do you find that interesting? Good. Three of us did. So we'll go with it. Let's go back to chapter 4. Chapter 4. Now, again, we're going to look at something today that's so incredible that we wouldn't believe it unless the Bible spoke about it time and time again. So I'm going to pick it up in chapter 4, verse 1, and it says, after these things, and we've talked about that, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me said, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Now verse 2, it says, immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold a throne was standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne. Then it begins to describe what's going on around the throne. So uh, there in verse 2, my translation says immediately I was in the Spirit. Other translations say it's slightly different. It'll say instantly I was in the Spirit. I've always liked the word instantly more than immediately because instantly sounds a lot more instant. So so I just like it. So, so now this is the event that we typically refer to as the rapture of the church. Here's a voice saying, come up here. He goes up where church is no longer part of the story from chapter four, verse one. And we're going to find that the church is there around the throne. So go ahead and write this down. The rapture is when Jesus comes for his church and all believers on the earth. Now chapters four and five, and we won't go into it today, but chapters four and five is a picture of the church that's been removed and is around the throne of God there in heaven. Let me uh, put a verse on the screen. In chapter five, again, chapter four and five is a picture of the church around the throne in heaven after the rapture. And uh, the church is saying, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings, us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. That's a a big story there, but uh, the idea is that those of us who've been redeemed, that can only be referring to the church. So at this point, the church is there in heaven. You recall when at the last supper, Jesus is having dinner with his disciples And there on your outline, Jesus describes it like this. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. And he's going to tell them something very strange, so before he does, he says, if it were not so, I would have told you. And here's what he says. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I've underlined this, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So here in this verse, he's not coming back to be with us on the earth. He's coming back to receive us to go be where he is in heaven, where he has been preparing a place for us. Does that make sense? So this is talked about throughout the Bible. One of my favorite passages comes from Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah 26, it says it like this. We'll read it, and then we'll unpack it. But he says, come my people, and I've underlined that, enter into your rooms and close your doors behind you. Hide for a little while until the indignation runs its course. For behold, the Lord is about to come out from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. It won't be just a a localized place. This is going to be the entire earth, a, a whole world event. So a couple of things that we see in that little passage. First of all, he says, come my people. It's only his people that hear his voice. And so this this would be an allusion to the church. And what they hear is, come up here. Come up here, just like John heard. And then it says, enter into your rooms, which is interesting because Jesus just said, I go to prepare a place for you. And they enter through an open door. John says, I saw a door standing open in heaven. So they enter into this open door. Then it says, and close your doors behind you. So they enter through that open door and then it's closed. And then it says, hide for a little while until the indignation runs its course. Um, I'm going to suggest they're going to be tucked away for about seven years. Uh, Longer than that, but, but during that time period, you and I would call it the tribulation. And so God's people are removed, 
they're tucked away, they're safe with him while the events of the tribulation take, take place. So you have the rapture of the church, the church goes up, and which is followed by, and you want to write this down, the seven year tribulation, the Bible calls it. So in Matthew's gospel, Jesus is teaching there in chapter 24, and Jesus says, for then there shall be great tribulation, such has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, nor ever shall be. The events that we saw in, in the world, in World War II and places like that, are nothing compared to what that time period is going to be like. In that time, there's going to be events that will be global, they, they will be uh, spiritual, they will be geological, they will be financial. A number of things are going to take place uh, in that time that, that we've, we've talked about, and they'll be on a global scale. It's in that time period of the tribulation that that one who's referred to as the Antichrist, he's going to be revealed in that time. We won't be here, but he'll be revealed. And uh, notice there in your outline in Revelation 13, it says, no one will be able to buy or sell except for the one who has the mark. So it'll be in that time, there'll be an attempt of a one world government, a one world currency, and uh, ultimately it's not going to work. Uh, We talk about that more in our Revelation series. But after that time period called the tribulation, uh, there's the event that's called the second coming. Now the second coming of Jesus is where Jesus, you want to write this down, Jesus comes back with his church to the earth. So this is not where we go up to be with him, it's where he comes back with us. And uh, that's found in Revelation chapter 19 verses 11 through 16, and that's at the end of, of the book of Revelation and you can read that. But Paul would say it like this, there in your outline. Paul says, so that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus, and I've underlined, with all his saints. With all his saints. Jesus can't come back with his saints until he comes for his saints. Then we're tucked away and then we come back with him. So our focus today is, but did I put you to sleep yet? Okay, let's see if this will do it. But our focus today is to talk about this event that's referred to as the rapture of the church. This is sort of the big picture we just gave. And we've looked at some of the things that that it would be like in that final generation, uh, the things that would be taking place. And we've looked at some passages. We haven't looked at all the passages. So for instance, just one real quick, Paul writes to Timothy there in your outline, and Paul says, but realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, revilers, disobedient to parents, um, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, without, uh, we'll talk about that word, malicious gossips, without self-control, I've underlined self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. There, there's a lot going on there, just a couple of things. First of all, when it says, realize this in the last days, when it says difficult times, the word there is kalipos, it just means violent. It just means violent. Just violent times will come. And certainly we see that. Um, many of you who are old enough to remember 30 years or so ago, uh, we, we never had an alarm system in our house. We didn't think we needed it. But most of us have an alarm system now in our house, don't we? And uh, I lived in a farm in Ohio when I, my first church that I pastored, and um, we didn't have the key to the door, but we didn't need it. But now for you to go to that house today, not only do they have a key for the door, but there's an alarm system in it because it's moving in that direction. So uh, then it says, for men will be lovers of self, and which is uh, their way of saying self-esteem. I don't know if I put self-esteem in parentheses. Did I put that in parentheses on your? It's interesting. Paul says, no, it's going to be like something we've never seen before. Before I went into the ministry, I thought that I was going to be a clinical psychologist, so I got a master's degree in psychology, counseling psychology. And uh, I found out that I am a lousy counselor. But, but it was in that time, in every class, the emphasis in the class was always if we can teach people to love themselves, then all problems go away. What they really need to do is just raise their self-esteem and everything would be fine. And uh, it was at that time where Whitney Houston was singing the song, you know, the greatest love of all is learning to love yourself. 
And Paul says it's going to be like nothing we've ever seen before. They're going to really be focused in on being in love with themselves. It says, goes on, it says, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, just very quickly. That just means without truce. There'll be people that you cannot make a truce with no matter how you try to appease. Malicious gossips, there'll be talk show hosts with that. That was funnier in my office. <laughs> without self-control. So prior, prior to uh, going to Calvary Fort Lauderdale, I worked as a drug counselor, um, as a at the, uh, substance abuse counselor. And what hits me and hits everybody in the field is that this generation sees substance abuse unlike any other generation in the world. I mean, it's, it's so rampant. And uh, it's just a unique thing that we see in this generation. Brutal haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they've denied its power. There's a whole lot in there that we could talk, talk about, but we're, that's kind of the picture of the last, that last generation. But this event called the, the rapture is something that throughout the Bible we're taught, and you want to write this down, will happen instantly and be worldwide. Instantly and will take place worldwide. Paul says, behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. He's saying we won't all die, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, literally uh, an eye blink, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. When Paul says, I tell you a mystery, the word mystery in their language is different than, than our language. When they said mystery, the word was mysterion, which meant that it has been a mystery, but is now revealed. In our language, we say mystery, it doesn't mean something's been revealed. In their language, it meant this has been a mystery, but it will now be revealed. And what will be revealed is that we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed instantly in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. Now, when you read that, there are several last trumpets in the Bible. This will be the last trumpet that the people on the earth who are believers will hear as they are taken to heaven. There's more trumpets, but, but for the believer, that's the last one. The trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we shall be changed. And the twinkling of an eye, John said, instantly I was in the spirit. Now, Jesus would teach it like this there on your outline. In Luke 17, Jesus said, I tell you, that on that night there will be two in one bed. And so there in the parentheses you want to just write night. One will be taken and the other will be left. There will be two women grinding at the same place. Now that would be the morning. In the Middle East the women would take the meal and then they would grind that so they could bake bread throughout the day. One will be taken and the other will be left. Two men will be in the field. That will be the day. One will be taken and the other will be left. Now there's a couple of things. First of all, one is taken, the other one is left. Not everybody is taken. It's, 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 uh, believers are taken, those who are not believers will not be taken. It's also interesting that Jesus taught this 2,000 years ago. You have this worldwide event, day, night, morning. And the reason that's so interesting is that it's only been the last 600 years that people have believed that the world was round. But Jesus taught about an event that would take place simultaneously. It would be night, day, and morning, a worldwide event. And it would be uh, instantaneous. Well, for that reason, I want you to turn all the way back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. When you study 1 and 2 Thessalonians, one one of the things that hits you is that Paul was only there in Thessalonica for three weeks. And being there in three weeks, as he responds to their questions, he had literally spent three weeks teaching them about end times prophecy. And so as time is going on, uh, it's been a while, it's been a few years since Paul was there, and they're, they're seeing that some of the people in their church have passed away. And they were thinking that Jesus was going to come back very quickly. Not only that, but they're beginning to experience persecution. So they begin to ask questions like, did we miss the rapture? Are we now in the tribulation period? And Paul deals with that. No, that hasn't happened. Here's some things that, you need to, that, that you'll see. 
So one of the questions uh, that Paul deals with, and we're going to pick it up in verse 13, is how does this whole thing go down, this whole event called the rapture? Chapter 4, verse, th- verse 13, Paul says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren. Now when Paul says, I don't want you to be uninformed, that's his way of saying, don't miss this. Don't miss this. This is important. I don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, those who passed away, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. So as believers, we grieve when somebody passes away. We just don't grieve like those who have no hope. Uh, Our hope is that there comes a day when we see Jesus and we see our loved ones who also know Jesus. And so we don't grieve like those who say this is the end and and it's all over. Verse 14, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. And, And very quickly what he's saying is that what he's now about to talk about, if you can believe that Jesus died and he rose again, then you can also believe this event called the rapture where we will meet the loved ones there in the air. He knows he's going to say some very strange things. So verse 15, he says, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, by the word of the Lord. We're not making this up. This is one of Paul's crazy ideas. This is from the Lord. That we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. There's going to be a last generation. People are going to be alive, and uh, Jesus is going to come back for that generation, but we will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So very quickly, you hear a shout. John said, I heard a voice like a trumpet saying, come up here. Uh, Paul said, you know, the, the, the trumpet will sound and it will be immediately changed. So it's, it's reiterating that. Verse 17 is the kind of what we're focusing in on. He says, then we who are alive and remain, this is a final generation, will be caught up. And I've underlined the word caught up, however your Bible says it. Caught up together with them in the clouds, in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. So we shall always be with the Lord. So here he says that final generation, we will be caught up and we will meet the Lord in the air. Do you remember a few moments ago we read from John's gospel and one of the things that we said, Jesus speaks to his disciples at the last supper and he says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to be with me so that where I am, there you can be also. We meet him in the air. This event is not where he comes back to the earth. So he he receives us in the air. Verse 17, again, he says, for we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so we shall always be with the Lord. And then verse 18, therefore comfort one another with these words. How many of you have ever heard somebody say, well, you, you know, the word rapture isn't even in the Bible. You ever heard that? So in, in one sense, that's true. It's true. But in another sense, it's, it's really not true. So there on your outline, I put verse 17. It says, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. And interesting, the Greek word there for caught up is harpazo. So many people will refer to it as harpazo. The Bible was written, the New Testament was written predominantly in Greek, and it was put together, kind of codified in the 300s. And once they, they put it together as the Bible, one of the first things that they did was they translated the Bible into Latin. And that was not a bad thing. Uh, And the reason that they made the decision to to translate the Bible into Latin is because Latin is considered a dead language. It does not change. So if you have a King James Version, you know, English changes. So if you have a King James Version and you go to Matthew 18, Jesus says, suffer the little children to come unto me. And uh, those of us who aren't familiar with the King James would go, 
what do you mean by that? Suffer the little children. Well, 150 years ago, the word suffer meant allow. So you have the women's suffrage movement it meant to, to allow them to be able to vote, allow them to be citizens is the idea. So they, they put it into Latin. Now the problem with putting it into Latin is that none of us read Latin. Or if, at least I don't. So you know, most of us don't. So what's interesting is there the Greek word would be harpazo for caught up, but the Latin word there in the Latin Vulgate is rapper. Does everybody see that there in your outline? From where we get the English word rapture, rapper, rapture. Uh, another way of saying that would be raptus, raptus. And so on the one hand, the word rapture does not appear in your English Bible, but the Bible was in Latin for a thousand years. So it's there just in the Latin Bible, not the English Bible. Did that change anybody's life by any chance? Did you at least find that interesting? Good, three of us did. So here, here is the big finish. Verse 18, Paul says, therefore. In verse 18, does it begin with therefore? So you want to underline, anytime you have the word therefore or so or something like that, you always want to ask, what is it there for? And it's usually based upon what I've just said you need to do this or understand this. So here he says, therefore, based upon everything that I've just said, he says, comfort one another with these words. So here's what he's telling us. And you want to write this down. I know some of your Bibles will say encourage, some will say comfort, however your Bible says it, write it down. The teaching of the rapture is given to be a comfort or an encouragement. From Paul's perspective, it wasn't something that was to be weird or something that you don't talk about. It was something to be a comfort. Uh, By the way, that word comfort there or encourage, parakaleo, just means to console, to encourage, strengthen by consolation. So why why would this teaching of the rapture be an encouragement? Well, in church world, there's a couple of terms. One term is called post-trip. And many people believe that the the rapture of the church takes place at the end of that seven-year tribulation. And we follow the outline of the Bible. It takes place before that begins and the church is removed and we see all the verses. So let's say that the the rapture of the church takes place at the end of that seven-year time period of tribulation. So somebody were to say, here's the good news. You get to go through seven years of tribulation Doom, death, destruction, pestilence, slaughter, wars, all types of horrific things. But the good news is at the end of that, you get to be raptured. Is anybody comforted by that? I personally am not. So what about this? What if somebody were to say, well, and and this is called mid-trip. We believe that the the rapture takes place halfway through that time period of the tribulation. And they were to say, look, for Three and a half years, you've got to go through this tribulation, doom, death, destruction, mayhem, slaughter, you know, pestilence, all of that warfare, everything, just, just going to be incredibly horrific. But halfway through that, you are raptured up. So you get to look forward to three and a half years of that time period up called the tribulation. Is anybody encouraged by going through three and a half years of that? I personally am not. However, if somebody were to say, Here, here's the thing. Um, before all those things come upon the earth, that time period called the tribulation where they're saying, hide, you know, let the rocks fall on us, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb and all the things that take place. Before that takes place, Jesus comes, pulls us out. We are removed, tucked into the rooms with Him while the indignation passes. And so we miss those things that are going to come upon the earth completely. Uh, is that encouraging? It is to me. It is to me. Some people would say, well, you're just trying to get out of that time period of the tribulation. You betcha. You betcha. (laughs) No argument there. So it's called, it's commonly referred to as our blessed hope that Jesus does come back, takes the church before these things happen, which is why Paul would say to the church, you are not destined for wrath. And so you don't face these things, and Jesus removes us. One of the most fascinating things, none of us would believe it if the Bible didn't speak about it throughout the entire Bible. We just shared a couple of verses. Did you find that interesting today? Well, we only have a couple more weeks 
of Bible prophecy, and uh, then we're going to, after that, jump into the book of Acts, and I think you're going to find that to be a very, very fascinating study. Let's go ahead and close, close in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that this teaching of the rapture is to be a comfort. You didn't give it because it was weird or strange, and you talk about it throughout. Lord, we're just grateful for the salvation that you've given to us. And we're thankful, Lord, that we get to encounter you now in this time period in grace and your mercy where we receive you now and we have salvation, we have your Holy Spirit, we have purpose and meaning in this life, we have all that you want to accomplish in us. And uh, Lord, we're grateful for that. And for any who are here today who have not embraced him and all of that. You just simply invite him to step in to your life and to save you. And he promises that when you say, Jesus, come into my life, forgive me of my sins. I want this relationship with you. He'll step in. And it's that simple. It's so simple that many people miss it. But if that's you today and you want him, you just say, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. I want you. I want this relationship. And he promises to step into your life. He'll begin to work and move his purpose in you and through you. And you'll never regret it. If that's you today, after the service, there's going to be some prayer partners standing by in the front. They'd love to pray with you as you solidify that decision. Let us know by marking it on your connection card. We'd love to send some information to you. Father, I pray that you keep each and every one of us until we meet again. Thank you for this congregation who loves your word and the things of God. Again, keep us till we meet again. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and all God's people said, God bless you guys. We'll see you next time.